Hello, I'm Peter Bard, your host for Meet Natural Hygiene. The following program will introduce you to a remarkably simple and effective health system, natural hygiene. Natural hygiene is a way of life that realizes and is fully in accordance with our natural human biological makeup and has been proven to be a key to dynamic health. Why should you be interested in natural hygiene? Because natural hygiene believes that you can attain each and every one of your health goals. Whether you wish to lose or gain weight, increase your energy level, improve your appearance, or simply overcome those nagging health problems, you can join the thousands of people who have applied these principles and are living better and feeling better every day. Our program features Mr. T.C. Fry, one of the most prominent educators in the field today. So now, let's meet Natural Hygiene. The benefits have been incredible. Uh, I used to weigh close to 200 pounds. Um, I weigh about 120 now. I feel good. I look much better. And I'm real grateful to be alive. Really grateful to be alive. And I really can say that fasting and natural hygiene has literally saved my life. I feel like a walking miracle. You will lead a practically sickness-free life because you will no longer pollute your body. You will keep it internally clean through the practices of natural hygiene. And there will be no necessity for the body to initiate and conduct disease. You will not be subject to the degenerative diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular problems. Your energy levels will increase tremendously and you will be more radiant and alive. You will eliminate medical bills, hospital bills, dental bills, insurance bills, and drug bills almost totally from your life. You will feel great. You will feel euphoric, exuberant, and very vigorous. You will uh, have improvements in so many areas of your life that they're innumerable really. Your strength will increase. You're, you'll look 20 years younger and you'll enjoy life a lot more and you'll live a lot longer without the miseries and suffering through which most people go before they die. Statistically, older people live much longer on natural hygiene than they do conventionally. The statistics show that today the average person about 10 to 15 years before death has a multitude of diseases. They have constant suffering, they're constantly under physicians or nursing home care, and they live quite miserably, and most people neglect them, and they're not happy as a rule. One of the great benefits for older people is that they will totally avert the pain and suffering that statistics show most of them go through. They'll avert nursing homes, they will have no pain, no suffering, and no miseries from the many diseases that finally overtake them in the terminal stage of their life. In natural hygiene, people die a natural death, a way of dying so rare today that it's not even listed as a statistic in the almanac. I've been a hygienist for 50 years. It's an incredible way of life. In 1976, I decided then that I was going to do what I had been dreaming of for many years, and that is to ride a bicycle from Los Angeles to Boston. And so, in that year, in June of 1976, I got on my bicycle, and 40 odd days later, I arrived at my destination and completed what I wanted to do just one week before my 71st birthday. Natural hygiene has absolutely been the best thing that I've ever done. The benefits of natural hygiene are many. They include increased energy, freedom from worry about ill health and growing older, an end to dieting. Proper weight maintenance is easy with natural hygiene. A sustained feeling of well-being and vitality. Reduced medical bills and other health costs. Natural hygiene will put you in control of your health. You can overcome nagging diseases as you learn how to eliminate their causes by applying the simple and common sense principles of natural hygiene.
Well, natural hygiene began in 1822 in Derby, Connecticut. An MD, Dr. Isaac Jennings, despaired of losing so many of his cholera patients, and he decided that he would no longer dispense drugs to them. So he took sugar pills and bread pills, and he gave them those. Actually, they were placebos. And he instructed them to take them every three or four hours with a glass of water. He instructed them also that they could not eat while they were taking these pills, otherwise the pills wouldn't work. He was actually practicing a delusion upon them. However, they were in effect fasting. And he ceased to lose cholera patients. And his track record became so great that people beat a path to his door. And the County Medical Society will know the secret of these marvelous new drugs he was using. In 1830, about, there was a, a preacher, a minister, in Philadelphia by the name of Sylvester Graham. He took up the cudgels for natural hygiene, and he built it into a mass movement. This is the Graham who's responsible for what's called Graham bread and Graham crackers. He's, his movement spread so wide that many famous people undertook to practice natural hygiene. The movement took in perhaps as much as 10% of the American population. It had some great uh, children, so to speak. Louisa May Alcott, the great author, she, she and her brother were hygienists. Florence Nightingale was a hygienist. And she tried to bring the philosophy and practices of natural hygiene to hospitals. And of course, her success was so phenomenal that she is known this day as the mother of nursing, one of the foremost nurses of all time. Well, the movement went very much into eclipse with the advent of the germ theory promulgated by Louis Pasteur. And of course, the drug interest of the time uh, could not do a business with healthy people and they went on the bandwagon to get people to take drugs and run to doctors when the germ theory came around. In other words, your sicknesses had nothing to do with your practices but because you have been unfortunate enough to have been laid low by a germ. So when was the revival of natural hygiene? When did that take place? Well, there have been hygienists all through this time, some of them quite famous, notably Bernard McFadden and Dr. Herbert M. Shelton. And Dr. Herbert M. Shelton was born in 1895 near Greenville, Texas. At the age of 16, he discovered natural hygiene and through the writings of the old masters, such as Trawl and Edward Hooker Dewey. And he became an avid student. And during the First World War, he was in the Army. And of course, the Army personnel who listened to him and took his advice never contracted the flu so-called, whereas those around him were not only getting it, but were submitting to medical treatment and dying like flies. And after the war, he began writing for McFadden Publications and some of the health magazines that he published. And in the 1920s, he became an avid student of Dr. John Tilden. Dr. John Tilden was a practitioner who uh, elaborated the toxemia theory of disease. And Dr. Shelton began his own writings in 1928 with the publication of Human Life, Its Philosophy and Laws. And that made him perhaps the foremost hygienist of the time. He was only 33. And until his death last year at the age of 89, he was perhaps the best known hygienist in the world. And we still look up to him very much because not only was he lead a leader, but he less left us a legacy of hygienic literature. It's unrivaled by any writer before or since. Natural hygiene has enjoyed a great resurgence of late, especially due to the 
best-selling book written by Harvey and Marilyn Diamond, Fit for Life. To what do you attribute the tremendous success that Fit for Life has had? Well, number one, the people in this country have been steadily losing confidence in the medical profession. For instance, a mere 15 years ago, about 80% of the American people, according to the Roper poll, or the Alma Harris poll, one of those polls, said that they had confidence in the medical profession. Today, that confidence level is in the 35 to 40% range. And, of course, the people were right for this. Number two, the book was promoted as a weight loss book, and because it worked, it received a lot of word-of-mouth recommendation, and it continues to be a bestseller. But we have many very notable people who are very deep and profound in their mastery of natural hygiene, notably Dr. Alec Burton, Dr. Virginia Vivitrano, Dr. Ralph Sinke, and many others. I think that natural hygiene is just a fabulous way of life. It's very exciting, the whole program. It's so, it's been around for a long time, but today it really is like at its pioneering stage for the average, I think, American person. And it's just, it's just fabulous. I am so excited about it, and I'm glad to be here sharing this information with you. I think it's really great. The term natural hygiene is composed of two words, natural and hygiene. Hygiene means the science of health and as such touches upon everything that pertains to human well-being. The human body is totally self-operating and is self-sufficient if only the three primary needs of life are supplied, namely air, water, and foods of our biological adaptation. Just as you do not have to know the intricacies of aerodynamics to enjoy modern air travel, neither do you have to know the complexities of physiology and anatomy in order to appreciate perfect sickness-free health. Natural hygiene is a way of life. It is a set of common sense principles that are in accord with the way nature intended us to live. Well, natural hygiene uh, has many principles on which it is based. However, our primary stand is that we must properly meet our organism's needs. And it's, most of them are rather self-evident or obvious. For instance, we say the foremost need of life is good air. That's because of the immediacy of, immediacy of air and oxygen to life itself. Perhaps the next foremost need of life is for water because we can't live out without it, normally more than a few days. Water is the body's transport system, and it's only water that's needed, and the water that we should put into ourselves, if we do not get it from our foods, is for pure water, that is, distilled water, because anything in water, other than water itself, is a contaminant. The next need of life is maintenance of a comfortable body temperature because under certain temperature conditions the body can maintain temperature homeostasis and if we chill our bodies or we overheat our bodies the body cannot maintain a te an ideal operating temperature it's designed to operate between roughly 97 and 99 at maximum efficiency it becomes impaired if that temperature range is not maintained. The next form of need of life is cleanliness. Now when I speak of cleanliness, I'm going to emphasize internal cleanliness because most of us maintain external cleanliness quite well. Internal cleanliness means that we keep our bodies free of poisons and pollutants. Unfortunately, the standard American diet puts lots of toxic materials into us and the body finds it necessary 
through the agency of sickness, illness, or disease to have an extraordinary cleansing crisis on occasion. However, we can be free of these miseries if we just maintain a clean body. First, we should eat a non-polluting diet. Nothing should ever go into the body other than air, water, and foods of our biological adaptation. And foods that are contrary to our biological adaptation are very likely to pollute our bodies, especially if we eat them in a haphazard manner, as most Americans do. And of course, one of the surest indications that our bodies are being polluted is indigestion. The next foremost need of life could be termed sleep. It's more important than food because we can sleep, on, go without sleep only a few days, whereas we can go without food for weeks and even months, uh, which I don't advocate, but we can. Uh, we were introduced to this recently in the earthquake that hit Mexico City and where some people were in the rubble for two or more weeks without food or water and they came out of it in good condition. So sleep is very essential to health. Under that condition, the body regenerates the nerve energy which we need to keep us going. If we do not have nerve energy, it's tantamount to having a car with a tank full of gas but a dead battery. So it's really nerve energy, a low-grade electricity that keeps us going and keeps us vital and alive throughout the day. And we must sleep at night because we are diurnal creatures and nocturnal sleepers in order to best regain the nerve energy that we've expended during the day. Food, and that is what I rate as the next most important need, furnishes us the nutrients by which the body sustains itself. The body <coughs> carries ample reserves of nutrients, carries tremendous reserves of nutrients, as a matter of fact. That's why we can live for up to two or three months, or even in many cases four months or more, without anything other than air and water. When it comes to the subject of food, there is only one ideal food for humans, and that is the food of their biological adaptation, just as horses and cattle are biologically adapted to a single diet of grass all their lives, humans are biologically adapted to fruits. According to natural hygiene, fruit is the most ideal food for human consumption. It is the food of our biological adaptation. Fruit helps to wash the body free of toxins and furnishes us with nutrients immediately. It is our primary food. Secondarily, we can use vegetables, nuts, and seeds with great benefit. And, and then, of course, when you get to, shall we say, third-rate foods, you'll get into steamed and cooked potatoes, grains, and roots, and things of this nature. So I understand the biological classifications of different species of animals, and what you're saying is that we are f fruitarian, frugivores? Yes, we're frugivores. As you know, some birds are insectivores, and some birds are carnivores, and some birds are graminivores. And, and this has been scientifically <coughs> proven? Yes, this is, uh, you can find this in the biology books. Up until 1952, the, for instance, the Encyclopedia Britannica can be found to refer to frugivores and the frugivorous nature of humans and primates. You won't find it in the encyclopedia sense. Uh, the reason, because it is contrary to commercial interest that the truth be known in these matters. We can survive quite well on many foods other than what those I've named if we take care in how we eat them, how we combine them, what we eat them with, and how much of them constitute a portion of the diet. If you don't eat fruit foods of your biological adaptation, it's very important that you observe the proper proportions of them to eat in relation to your raw foods and how you combine them. 
The next most important need of life I would list as exercise. It is said that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for an individual to be healthy if he is not fit. So exercise is the means by which we keep ourselves fit. We must get exercise and vigorous activity at least three or four days out of the week and preferably seven days out of the week if possible. There are two kinds of activity which we should especially observe and that's called aerobic activity and resistance activity. Aerobic activities may be are those activities which ventilate the body and they may constitute such things as swimming, bicycling, jogging or running, or even vigorous walking, and other activities like dancing and, and rebounding, which cause the breath and the pulse to at least double. Resistance exercises means things such as weightlifting, push-ups, chin-ups, and things of this nature. And of course, heavy squats with weights on our back and almost any exercise that involves weights over and above our own is a resistance exercise. I would list as the next Im most important influence in our life, sunshine. I know sunshine has been poo-pooed a lot, but actually it is an essential of life. If you put a person in a dungeon without light, you will not live very long. So therefore we can deem it to be an essential of life. Sunshine is necessary to the effect to affect many processes that go on in the body, especially bone formation. You may have all the calcium in the world, the very best calcium, without sunshine, your body cannot properly assimilate it and form bone. How much sunlight should we get? We should get 20 to 30 minutes of sunshine daily, or perhaps on the order of about two hours to three hours in amount during the week. We should get our sunshine before 10 in the morning and after 4 in the afternoon during the summer, and it doesn't much matter in the winter. I rate as the next most important need of life, play and recreation. Just as humans consume themselves in their work and their activities, so should they rec recreate themselves through mental and physical pursuits wherein they find it very recreational, that is, recreational of their being. Uh, games played with other people such as tennis and racquetball, badminton, or baseball or softball or basketball are very constructive and that they help a person uh, feel good and better about themselves. However, there are mental recreation too, such as games of checkers and cards and chess. I rate as the next most important need of life is rest and relaxation. And of course, meditation or cogitation. Uh, we can, of course, take time out and cogitate at any time, but rest and relaxation affords us the opportunity to let the body catch up on its eliminative processes and of course to catch up on other chores. And during that time we might be well to reflect upon what we're about, what we want to do and what we intend to do, and perhaps we could even reflect philosophically. I rate as perhaps the next most important need of life is mental poise. That is, keeping a mental balance, keeping ourselves in an equilibrium so that we do not become emotionally upset or emotionally overwrought. When we become emotionally upset, that drains our nerve energy faster than anything I know of. I mean, if you were to get news of a death, or the news of your house burning down, that is likely to be a major emotional upset. And it's likely to drain us of our nerve energy. And of course, being frightened 
of what can happen to us may sometimes do likewise. And people have been known to die from just sheer fright. The next essential life I would rate very highly is security of life and its means. In order to survive without undue distress or stress, we should be reasonably assured that by reasonable effort, we will secure the means of life and that we will be free to enjoy it and pursue life as we envision, as we wish. And another essential of life would be creative work. When we have work by which we gain life's needs, when we feel that we have been intimate and involved in securing our needs through our own efforts, we feel satisfied and we have an assurance and confidence in ourselves that is rivaled by very little else that we can do. Another great need of life is self-mastery. We must realize that we are the total control of ourselves. We must have self-esteem. We must have self-reliance. We must be fully confident that we're in control of our life situation. The car indeed we are. Uh, I tell people that no one else can breathe for us. No one else can eat for us. No one else can drink for us. No one else can sleep for us. We, and we alone, can conduct our life. We're in control. Unless we exercise this control very diligently, we will falter and we will lose self-esteem. So self-mastery is quite essential as an element of health. Another need of life is to belong to a peer group. Humans are naturally gregarious. That means we came literally from a tribal form of society. And being gregarious, we must have our little circle or group of peers to which we can communicate ourselves, with whom we can interact and confide, and of course, identify with. Another great need of life is to express our natural instincts, especially the instinct of reproduction. Those who are denied this instinct tend to become aberrant in life, and many of life's processes become abnormal, especially is this true for women. Another great need of life is what we call love, appreciation, and esteem. This, of course, is one aspect of our gregarious nature. We must appreciate and love our fellow man. We must not only give this quality of ourselves but because we're naturally loving and kind but we must also in turn receive love and appreciation for without it we're like vines that are denied sunshine they cannot longer and well conduct the processes of life another great need of life is for the expression of our love of beauty Humans have an aesthetic disposition, that is, they appreciate beauty. And beauty to humans are those factors in life that favor and conduce to happy, well-rounded living. Whereas ugliness in our life is those factors which uh, are contrary to our best interest, to our best well-being. Last but not least among the needs of life is the need to be inspired and motivated. To thrive best and be most healthy, we must have purpose and commitment in life. Without this, life becomes listless and meaningless. Uh, these, that about sums up the most salient needs of life. Natural hygiene is built upon principles which meet the needs of life and most importantly, healthful living. These are clean air. Try to get clean air whenever possible. Pure water. 
a comfortable body temperature, internal cleanliness through the eating of proper foods and keeping our body free of poisons and pollutants, adequate sleep, proper foods. We need to eat a diet consisting predominantly of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. Exercise, sunshine, play and recreation, rest and relaxation, mental poise, security of life and its means, creative work, self-mastery, interaction with a peer group, expression of reproductive instinct, love, appreciation and esteem, love of beauty, inspiration, purpose, motivation. Food combining is one of the most important aspects of natural hygiene. When we do not eat predominantly of foods of our biological nature, that is fruit, it is most critical that we eat combinations that are enzymatically compatible. Indigestion is the first cause of disease and is present when we eat from the four food groups simultaneously, beginning in early childhood and continuing on throughout adulthood. Proteins and carbohydrates require two different chemical mediums in order for either to digest properly in the stomach. Proteins require an acid medium, while carbohydrates require an alkaline medium. When eaten together, for example, any typical meat sandwich, the body must produce the acid juices and alkaline juices at the same time. Simple chemistry states that acid and alkaline neutralize one another. Therefore, in this case, digestion has been severely retarded, causing the proteins to begin to putrefy and the carbohydrates to begin to ferment. This leads to the condition of indigestion and disease. The first rule of proper food combining states that proteins and carbohydrates should be taken at separate meals. A meal with meat should be eaten with vegetables and salad. A meal with carbohydrates, such as pasta, should also be eaten with vegetables and salad. Vegetables combine with either proteins or carbohydrates. An exception to this would be concentrated starchy vegetables, such as a baked potato, which is to be considered a carbohydrate, and therefore should be eaten without meats or other proteins. In other words, avoid steak and potatoes. Make them two different meals. What are the protein foods? They include all meats, including fish, nuts, peanuts, milk products, including cheese and yogurt, seeds, soybeans. What are carbohydrate foods? They include all potatoes and winter squashes, bread, grains and cereals, such as rice, wheat, oats, and barley, dry peas, dry beans, sugars, and honeys. Proteins and carbohydrates are considered concentrated foods. That is because they are practically devoid of water and thus harder to digest. Principle number two states that only one concentrated food should be eaten at any one meal. This leads to principle number three, which states that the ideal diet consists of 70 to 80 percent high water content food. High water content foods are fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables allow the body to conduct its vital cleansing process like an internal shower, thereby washing away toxic material from the body and helping to promote a state which is free of disease. Another important principle of food combining concerns the proper consumption of fruit. Principle number four states that fruit should be eaten by itself or 15 to 20 minutes before a meal, never with a meal or right after a meal. The reason for this is that fruit requires practically no digestion in the stomach. It needs to pass through the stomach to the intestines unobstructed. When fruit comes in contact with other foods, it ferments due to its high sugar content. Fermentation leads to indigestion and again is a major factor in the beginnings of disease. 
Principle number five concerns dairy products. According to natural hygiene, dairy products are a poor food and should be eliminated from the diet or drastically reduced. When eating dairy products, eat them alone or with a large green salad. We hope this introduction to food combining will help you make it a part of your lifestyle. We'll explore food combining in greater depth on other tapes in the Natural Hygiene series. The standard American diet has the acronym SAD, and it is indeed SAD. It nourishes us somewhat, however, it intoxifies our body considerably, and it causes nervous exhaustion, it causes stress, damage, it causes lots of problems with us. It's responsible primarily for all the diseases which we suffer in America. It uh, furnishes more than you bargain for. It furnishes um, uh, toxic materials, foods that are indigestible, foods that when eaten together are in a result in indigestion and there's a lot of evils about it and to that we can attribute most of our suffering and diseases. The concept of the four basic food group came from the Dairy Council back in 1946 and the U.S. Agricultural Department adopted it and it's been promoted ever since. It was not created by nutritionists or anyone who has anything to do with what the human organism requires. It was a commercial division in the marketplace, sort of a dividing up of the market among those who were then in it. So you're saying it was business, it was pure business. It was strictly business considerations. Mm. Boy, and then all these years I have thought that the doctors created the four food groups. Had... No, the physicians did not. The agricultural interest actually dictated food processors and people that they it was a an effort to educate the people through nutritionists through the media in order to get them to consume more of the foods which they purveyed well actually there's five food groups nutritionists and others don't want the fifth food group very widely advertised the first food group consists of what's called the meat category the protein category and it includes all meat including fish and it also includes nuts seeds and beans the next food group is called the dairy category and it consists of milk and milk products the next food group is the grain category and it consists of all grains including wheat oats rye rice and millet and the next food group is the vegetable fruit category and the fifth fruit group consists of such items as wine, beer, white sugar, uh, oils and snack foods. There is only one food group for humans really just as there's only one food group for cattle and horses and rabbits but the more foods that we eat outside that food group to which we're biologically adapted, the worse our health will be. America is one of the most diseased countries in the world. Uh, I understand that we have 90% uh, of the population is constipated. About 98.5% have defective or bad teeth. And when you look at the disease statistics in this country, they're truly frightening. Like 50% uh, of our people will die of cardiovascular conditions, about 25% will die of cancer, and another uh, 8 or 10% will die of diabetic conditions. Is that because our diet pre predominates in one particular food group, or, or is it that we take all the food groups every day, well, too much of them, or why is that? All right. The problem is that they do live on the basic five food groups and that is the problem itself the foods instead of nourishing their bodies as it should 
actually furnish impossible digestive tasks. And of course, foods not digested tend to be putrefied and fermented and, and to poison the body instead. In fact, a lot of the components of the basic five food group, that is in certain groups, are in themselves toxic. Sounds very grim. Proteins are in absolutely all foods in their raw state. Uh, protein is really a very minor nutrient. Uh, our energy comes from the glucose and fructose which we get in fruits and, uh, and from other carbohydrates. The energy is our primary, re energy is our primary requirement to the extent of about 90% of our intake of nutrients other than water and air. Amino acids only constitute about 4 or 5% of our nutrient needs. A mother's milk contains only about 1% protein. And as a grown up individual, I can't possibly require more than a growing baby. That's and true. fruits contain an average of about 1% protein. The meat industry has been brainwashing us for many decades that we need more of their product and we should eat more of their product. I mean, it's like the cigarette industry urging us to smoke and the beer industry urging us to drink more beer. Hmm. The idea is that the meat industry is in the same boat they are and it's a commercial practice to force all their product upon us that they can. So could all the meat that we're eating and getting uh, cause some of the diseases that we have? Uh, meat is one of the primary sources of our diseases. Let us take osteoporosis, for instance. We can lay at the door of meat eating uh, a great deal of osteoporosis. What, what Let us take arthritis, for instance. We can lay at the door of meat uh, such diseases as gout, rheumatism, arthritis, and bursitis. What is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis is a disease that most women over 40 suffer from and many men as well. And this is primarily a meat eater's disease, although it can be caused by grain eaters too. It's primarily caused by an acid forming diet. And of the basic five food groups, all but one of them are acid forming. Osteoporosis means literally por porosity of the bones. This means that the bones look like a Swiss cheese or a sponge. That is a case of the body having to take the calcium and other base elements from the bones in order to neutralize acid end products such as we experience when we have acid indigestion. Osteoporosis is caused by many, many factors other than an acid forming diet. For instance, like white sugar and white flour. The, the American diet is perhaps richer in calcium than any diet in the world. However, most of the calcium that Americans eat is not usable. One of the reasons it's not usable is because we're eating such products like milk in which the calcium is tied up in the casein package. After about the age of three, humans can no longer digest the casein of milk. And likewise, they cannot digest lactose because they also cease to secrete the enzyme lactase. Meats, of course, are very acid forming in our diet and they're also a heavy cause of this. The calcium that we get in most of our foods is in cooked foods. And when you cook foods, the calcium becomes back to an inorganic raw state as it is in rocks and soil and the body cannot use it in that form. Is milk an acid forming food? It certainly is. So basically what you're saying is then after what the age of three that we are not really capable of digesting milk? That's what I'm saying. Dairy foods are not a food at all 
And that's very interesting because I've been a school teacher and, and I, I always noticed that, that the doctors were saying to, that for the parents whose children were getting ear infections and allergies to cut down on dairy. Well, so. that's remarkable that they should do it because that is indeed part of the causes of respiratory problems as well as ear problems. You know, and a lot of people are uh, actually allergic to milk and dairy products. That's correct. Milk, eggs, and chocolate and things of this nature are among the number one allergies, or the foremost allergies mm -hmm. in this country. A study by Dr. Heavey at the Creighton University in Nebraska showed that calcium supplements and milk and other forms of calcium actually reduced the calcium uptake rather than aided it. Okay, let me ask you a question then. What should I eat to make sure that I get enough calcium. What foods? You should eat foods in a raw state that have calcium in a usable form. Are there any that are particularly high in calcium? Oh yes, there are many foods that are high in calcium, such as green leaves and broccoli, oranges, and other fruits. So I have to eat a lot more raw food than I've been used to eating? Perhaps. Uh, actually, we should eat at least 80% raw food in our diet. When you cook a food, you deaminate the amino acids and coagulate the proteins, which are composed of amino acids. You actually start breaking down the starches, and you return the minerals to an inorganic form, and in their inorganic form, minerals are poisonous. You can eat your conventional foods, providing you eat them in a sequence or at a time and in a combination that does not beget indigestion. You'll get more good out of them that way. Actually, we could get rid of the acid industry overnight. When I was a conventional eater, I had a Melanta tablet stored in my pockets, <laughs> in my car compartment, in my night table, in my desk drawers. Good. I had them everywhere because when the heartburn came on, I had to have them. You because were prepared. I I was prepared for the suffering. I did not realize at that time that my diet was actually causing this problem. And so how long did it take for that to leave once you learned this? I have not taken one antacid tablet from that day to this, 16 years ago. I was over the problem with the very first day that I changed to the new diet. <laughs> And let us take uh, cardiovascular disease. 90% of American people have it, and about 50% of them will die from it. This is caused primarily by eating high-fat, high-cholesterol foods. The body is unable to use heated fats. It is unable to digest and utilize animal cholesterol. In rejecting this when it is absorbed, it stays in the bloodstream and it combines with minerals, inorganic minerals to be sure, and they form what is called plaque and plaque blocks the arteries. And when the arteries are sufficiently blocked, we may have what we call coronary insufficiency or an infarction because the body does not, the heart does not get enough blood and does not get enough oxygen. So fats are a real offender then? The Fats are one of the biggest offenders in the American diet. Uh, I would, it'd be a hard choice between proteins and fats mm. as the biggest offenders in the American diet. The proteins are offenders because we eat them primarily cooked and deranged such that they putrefy in the digestive tract, whereas fats are heated also such they're indigestible. When a fat is heated, it forms what is called acroline, which is an outright carcinogen. A scary term for it is pyrrolated hydrocarbons. Cancer is caused by carcinogens. Carcinogens, when they continually assault the cells, literally drive the cells crazier or make them goofy. They cause genetic changes. The cell ceases to be contributing of, of value to the organic system. Normally the body has the vitality to kill these cells. But when we get the stage where it's called cancer, that means that the intake of carcinogens is overwhelming the body's ability to kill the product. And when this happens, 
the cancer cells themselves will proliferate also. And the proliferation of cancer cells begins the process of death. Well, you know, I've heard that children now get um, leukemia, which is a form of cancer, at a very young age. Yes. Uh, cancer is the number one killer of children. Leukemia is cancer of the white blood cells. And it's diet related? And, uh... It is very diet related. We have many instances of children overcoming leukemia merely by being put on a raw diet of fruits and vegetables. The standard American diet is a heavy cause of cancer because it contributes heated fats, which are carcinogenic. The intestinal flora break down proteins into many toxic byproducts, which when absorbed prove to be carcinogenic. And of course, Americans eat many foods that are poisonous outright such as uh, alcohol and they smoke and and they uh, take caffeine and other substances that are carcinogenic. Uh, diabetes is caused by the breakdown of the Isle of Langerhans in the pancreas such that the body is unable to secrete insulin. The cause of this is not sugar to which it's been attributed but it's caused by the po poisons that arise primarily from putrefying proteins within the intestinal tract. If we ate a high carbohydrate diet and a very low fat and low protein diet, we'd all be much healthier. It should be obvious that the standard American diet is killing the American people. Natural Hygiene believes that the standard American diet is one of the major causes of disease in this country. By following hygienic guidelines, a person can drastically reduce the risk of disease, improve or overcome many health problems, and end obesity and the struggle of weight control. Natural Hygiene recommends that you incorporate the following principles into your lifestyle and reduce or eliminate poisonous habits, follow the principles of food combining, Eat a diet of at least 70 to 80 percent high water content foods. Consider and apply the 19 principles of hygiene and respect the natural body cycles. The body operates on three eight hour cycles. The elimination cycle, 4 a.m. to noon. During this cycle, the body is eliminating waste materials and house cleaning. Nothing but fruit or fresh fruit juice should be consumed until noon. Appropriation cycle, 12 noon to 8 p.m. During this cycle, the body wants to take in its fuel. It is best to eat during these hours. Assimilation cycle, 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. During this cycle, the body is processing and absorbing the nutrients consumed. No food should be eaten during these hours with the exception of fruit if desired three to four hours after the last properly combined meal. These ideals represent the cornerstone of natural hygiene. They are truly the key to dynamic health. About, uh, oh, I'd say about eight years ago or so, I came down with an excruciating itch. It occurred through anywhere from the top of my scalp to the bottom of my feet, in between my toes, literally all parts of my body. It was ex just excruciating. I, I couldn't stand it. I went to Kaiser, which I belonged to at that time, and I, I talked to a dermatologist. A dermatologist said it was caused by either one of two things, either from nerves or from some type of allergy. Well, they quickly ruled out any kind of allergy, and they attributed it to nerves which they referred to as neurodermatitis. The dermatologist then prescribed uh, at, uh, at one time Atarax and another time Vistaril, which were very powerful medications. They prescribed want to take one every four hours and uh, just continually. And what, uh, bec because it really just knocked me out the first time, I took one 
at night, not during the day, because I really couldn't take it at, at, uh, during the day. Took one at night and waited until my itch came back which was normally in the area of about three or four days. Then I took another pill. Well, this went on for about, oh, about uh, three, four, five years. And in between, or during this time, I went to a number of dermatologists. And they all said the same thing. The chances of us finding the cause of your uh, excruciating itch, really, as Chickern would say, slim and none. Well, I was playing tennis with a friend of mine who was a pharmacist, and Len told me, he said, that stuff, the Vesterol and the Atarax would kill you. He said, try chlorotrimeton, which is an over-the-counter antihistamine. Well, I did that, and sure enough, it worked just as well as the other drugs, and it wasn't as powerful. And I took, again, I took the same, uh, about the same dosage, one every three or four days. Well, by this time, my wife, who really got into uh, nutrition, um, told me that this stuff will kill me if I continue to take it the rest of my life. So she talked me into going on a fast. So I was, I'm really a born skeptic, but I would, you know, I would try, <laughs> I told her I would try anything. So I went on a fast, at that time I weighed 155 pounds, and over about a two or three week fast, and I had to stay home from work, of course. It was water fast, juices, uh, and enemas. Uh, I lost 10 pounds, but no effect uh, on, the, on the itch. And I still took the medication, although I did, during, over this period, try to cut down a little bit. Then, after, I'm not even sure now, but I think possibly after a month or so, she convinced me to go on another fast. And this time I went from uh, 145 pounds down to 135, which is the same weight that I was when I was 18 years old and entered the armed forces. Well, at the end of this time, believe it or not, and uh, I was a skeptic and I really didn't think would, it would work, but I, did, I felt I had nothing to lose, I had re gradually reduced the, my dosage of the chlorotrimeton, and actually I would cut it in, in half and literally in quarters. At the end of the second fast, my itching was completely gone and with no need for any further medication. It was just unbelievable. And an another part was I would tell a lot, of, a lot of my friends and a lot of my relatives about what happened, and no one would really believe it. And I could not, in talking to all of the, uh, all of the medical doctors at uh, Kaiser or any other medical doctor, any other dermatologist, they would not go along with any type of uh, fasting or you know, cleansing of the body to rid myself of the itch. They just didn't, not only didn't believe in it, they wouldn't even care to listen to me about what I was going to go through or what I had actually experienced. It's just, they're just very, most of them I would say are just, you know, very, very closed when it comes to this kind of um, uh, treatment, which is, you know, just pure and simple natural treatment, which to me just makes sense. To overcome disease, it's best first to understand what disease is. Disease is a body-initiated process, and it's conducted also by the body for the purpose of cleansing and healing. The causes of disease must first be discontinued if we hope to eliminate disease from our life. And of course, we must in its stead institute healthful conditions. It is a condition of the body called toxemia or toxicosis. The disease is really the poisons and morbid matters held within. The 
what we call disease is really a body process of ridding itself of these poisons wherein the body turns all its energies to cleansing and repairing damages done. When I'm having a cold or a flu, what's really going on? When you have a cold, the body is exuding its accumulated body waste and the poisons taken in from the outside directly into the respiratory tract, through the sinuses, and of course the nasal membranes. The body secretes lots of mucus as a carrier to carry these poisons out of the body. That very simply is what a cold is. A cold is really the way the body elects in which to eliminate accumulated toxins. I can recite many cases under my care where people have overcome very serious diseases. For instance, uh, I might recite the case of a 19-year-old girl who was the first client at the institution which was formed in Yorktown, Texas. She came at 145 pounds, she was about 5'2". Her face looked like she had suffered uh, bomb explosions like the crater of the moon. She had very severe acne. She was morose, sullen, and withdrawn. She was there because her parents had sent her there to recover from epilepsy. And she was on drugs at the time. Dr. Senke supervised her fasting. After about seven days, she was re very happy because the pustules were disappearing from her face. And after about two weeks, not only were the pustules completely gone, but the scars on her face from severe acne began to recede and were not nearly as noticeable. At the same time, she had also become very, very sociable with the other there. She had lost about 20 pounds in two weeks and she was beginning to look very svelte. She fasted a total of 21 days. During all that time, she did not suffer one seizure. And on the 21st day when she broke her fast, you would never know really that she had acne unless she looked very close. She stayed with us two more weeks while she realimented on fruits and at the end vegetables and nuts. And her recovery was very complete. She didn't have one seizure. She was down to about 110 pounds and she was elated. She was very outgoing and very effusive in her association with others. She even had a young man who had came to the institution as a resident to pay her very serious attention. And of course, she never had any further seizures up to a year later that we kept track of her. I can also recite another case of a woman who was diagnosed as cancerous and she was advised to go immediately to the MD Anderson Hospital in Houston. And if she didn't go, she would be dead within two weeks. Well, she demurred at the idea of having a colostomy and having a hysterectomy where these two sites of cancer were diagnosed. Instead, she called me at the, urging her, her brother, who was a student of natural hygiene, and she asked me what I thought. I asked her to read me the diagnosis, and she read them to me twice. And as far as I could determine, determine all she had really was tumors. She had the growth about the size of a grapefruit in her uterus, and she had total blockage of the sigmoid colon. So I told her to come to our institution and I felt we could help her. And she did come. She fasted about five or six days and she had free passage through the sigmoid colon. And the tumor in her uterus reduced in size considerably. She kept on fasting and at the end of 14 days, she could no longer detect the tumor in the uterus. And of course, by the 14th day, her anus 
was completely free. We fasted her four more days and broke the fast. And then she stayed with us 17 more days, during which time she ate fruits and vegetables. And when she went back to her doctor and presented herself and showed herself to be free of tumors uh, while he had diagnosed as cancer, without going to MD Anderson Hospital, he, he couldn't understand it, and he thought perhaps he had made a diagnostic error to start with. Spectacular recoveries, such as these, are regarded as among the miracles of natural hygiene. Three and a half years ago, I was quite ill, arthritic, with a lung condition called sarcoidosis, where I was confined to bed totally. Uh, occasionally, I could walk across a room, but in order to do that, I had to take 18 different medications per day breathe in an inhalator that would allow my lungs to be able to go from one place to another. A friend of mine told me about a natural hygienist called Harvey Diamond, and Harvey and Marilyn were giving a seminar. In order to get there, uh, a doctor friend of mine who was an internist, MD, went with me, and they half carried me into the first meeting. I was told that if I would combine my foods properly, get off of um, dairy products, and eat in a hygienic way, I had an opportunity, a chance to recover. So for the first week, I uh, started eating that way. At the end of the week, I was surprised to see that I didn't need my inhalators anymore in order to breathe or walk. I could walk unaccompanied. So I was able to toss away the inhalators. At the end of uh, the month, all the 18 different medications that I needed, I no longer needed. My arthritic condition started turning around. My lungs started uh, functioning better. I'm a nurse for 40 years, and I was told that I would never be able to work again. And three and a half years later now, I'm nursing full-time as a psychiatric nurse. I'm on the rebounder each day. My lungs have increased so uh, much better, and I'm so much healthier, that I'm able to breathe without coughing, talk without coughing, walk as much as I want to without being hampered. And my arthrit arthritic knees are so good that I can take my knees up to my chin now, do most things that I want to do, and enjoy living. And I thank, thank God for the day that uh, I found out about natural hygiene. Each day my body is cleaning out more and more. I'm enjoying living and being, and I'm very grateful. I was just raised hygienically and I didn't really know when I was about four that anybody ate conventionally. But then when I, I started to know about it and then I knew that I got raised this way and I think it's fun. What I think hygiene is about is not to um, have bad food or anything, to live good, not to have war or anything like that. And I enjoy hygiene. Good. I got uh, interested in natural hygiene about uh, six, seven months ago. And uh, prior to that, I, I was involved in health. I was a vegetarian for 10 years. But it quite wasn't enough. Uh, I tried everything. I tried macrobiotics, vegan, lacto-vegetarian, any ism, vegetarianism. I, I tried it all. I was, just wasn't satisfied. I wasn't as, as energetic as I thought I should be. And uh, I went to seminars, I did all that, and then uh, I went to uh, Harvey Diamond, uh, I went to see Harvey Diamond years and years ago, and uh, he talked about food combining, and I used to do that. And then when his name propped up again, I saw it in the title of a book, uh, Fit for Life, and I figured, well, I might as well read it, I mean, I did see him. And what attracted me about the book was T.C. Fry's name and the school that apparently he went to. And that's, that's really how it started because I wanted to call T.C. Fry the next morning and I did. The biggest thing, the biggest change I found was what it did to my thinking mentally. It cleared my thoughts. I, I was just happier mentally. And of course when I was happier mentally it affected me physically. And I can't say too many good things about it. it, it it's a wonderful feeling. It, it, it not only affects my health, it affects my 
outlook on life and it made my work my job easier I wasn't thrilled about my job but I'm able to go to work now not get upset because I know mentally where I'm at that's really important I used to weigh 210 pounds and I could not I could not get my weight down I was hooked on alcohol and drugs and very unhealthy relationships and I was whiskey bent and hell bound to self-destruction a victim of addictions from the standard American way of life. I almost had to get myself to the point where I was killed before I realized what I was doing to myself and what was at fault. I had been introduced to natural hygiene 10 years earlier and pushed it aside in favor of junk food and indulgences. And I went back to natural hygiene four years ago. Slowly but surely, I am achieving not only a level of physical health, but emotional health and mental clarity and a sense of my spirituality that I have never achieved in my life. And what I would like to do is help people realize that we are only sick because we are poisoning ourselves with a variety of toxic lifestyle practices. Natural hygiene has probably been the single greatest thing in helping me overcome my dental problems and also my stomach problems my ulcer natural hygiene in my life is is driving everybody around me crazy my energy is so high my enthusiasm is so great and people can't understand where it comes from what i'm doing and they just want to get a, get in on it and know what the secret is and it's just beautiful Fasting is an integral part of natural hygiene, especially in diseased conditions. Under the condition of the fast, the body can readily detoxify and repair itself. Proteins are a part of all living foods. It is impossible not to get enough proteins if you're eating raw foods. Mineral water should never be in the human diet. The minerals in water are inorganic, is obtained from metals, rock, soil, and ores. They cannot be utilized and are rejected by the body, and in fact, they're actually poisonous. The best kind of water to drink is pure water. We buy it as distilled water. Eggs are very bad for you. The whites contain avidin, which the body cannot digest. And of course, the egg yolk is practically pure fat and is very difficult to digest. Avidin is quite toxic to the human system. If you cook it, you destroy the avidin, but you also destroy the protein. It is coagulated and deaminated and beyond use. It becomes putrefactive soil for the intestinal bacteria. Perhaps you eat your fruit combined with other foods which they do not properly combine with. You have indigestion all the time for many reasons. You may be eating indigestible foods, but more likely you're eating foods in combinations that are incompatible in digestive chemistry. You can get several times your daily requirement of calcium on a natural hygiene diet of raw foods. Refined and processed foods usually have had most of their mineral and vitamin content removed, as well as in some cases the protein content. They have usually had 
preservatives, which are bacterial poisons added to them. And bacterial poisons are poisonous to our organism too. In this program, we hope you've become more acquainted with the wonders of natural hygiene. Look forward to many topics to be covered in the series from Life Science. Dynamic health is not reserved for a select few. By following natural hygiene and some of the principles that we've outlined here today, you too can experience a radiant high level of health. So come on and join us. Natural hygiene is a glorious way for you to achieve dynamic, vigorous health and live happily hereafter. It, it just gives me security and freedom. That's what it is, it's freedom. I know it's the answer to health. Freedom to become my real self. Natural hygiene is the best thing that ever happened to me. I recommend it to everybody. It's the only way to go. Natural hygiene has given me a way to live. Come on and join us. Come on and join us. Come on, join us. Come on and join us.